number six, Gospel of John, chapter number six. Um, <clears throat> continue on going through uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm thankful for Calvary Baptist Church. I'm very, very thankful for it. I'm thankful for the, the testimony that it has. I'm thankful for just the investment and and just over the years with the bus ministry and and that we're, we're we're praying that the lord allow us to start the bus ministry back up again here pretty soon just because of of covid and now that just the bus had sat for a while and so we're praying that the lord allow us to really get re- involved in that once again we certainly want to do that uh, but i'm just thankful for just throughout the, the generations of people who've come and gone sat in the pews of calvary baptist church that calvary baptist church is still here so, very, very thankful for that. So, John chapter number 6 is where we're going to be here this morning. And if you're physically able, and out of honor and respect for the reading of God's word, let's stand. John chapter number 6, begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Verse 5 says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And, And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in, in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves And when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. The title of the message is this, King of your heart or king of your belly? King of your heart or king of your belly? Because there's a difference. There's a difference. Now let's pray and then we'll be seated and get into the preaching. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful lord's day that you've given us lord i ask you that you would help us lord to hear from you this morning father i pray that you would just be with uh, those who are not able to be here lord i know father that there are some who are struggling during this time of year father i'm mindful of the homes that were burned in boulder and father just those who have who are entering into this new year lord without a home entering into this new year with nothing father we are blessed lord, help us to never ever take those blessings for granted so Lord, I pray that you would just be with us, Lord, and help us, Lord, to hear from you. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. A prayer request that was given to me just moments uh, before the service has started. It was that, church, we need to pray for uh, uh, Bennett Baptist Church there because I guess their, their pastor there had passed away from COVID. And so, and so the Bennett Baptist Church, they're, they're without a pastor at this moment. And so let's be mindful to pray for them uh, if you would. <clears throat> All right. You know, this past November, our church has, uh, every other year, our church hosts the High Plains Baptist Fellowship Meeting, or Preacher's Fellowship Meeting. And, uh, it's, and usually how that meeting consists is about around 8 o'clock or so, we have, we, well, we invite different preachers from around the area. We have preachers from Fort Collins come. We have a pastor from Fort Morgan, and, and Brother Brian Ricker, of course, he comes, and, and just other preachers just around the area, they, they, they make their way to here, Calvary Baptist Church, and, 
And usually the meeting, meeting starts off with, we have breakfast next door. You've got to have breakfast to start a meeting. You just have to have it. So we start breakfast next door. Now it's not a glamorous breakfast. It's donuts and danishes. So, all right. So a little bit of disappointing there. But so we have donuts and danishes and coffee and orange juice and, and just other things like that and some fruit. And then the meeting will start at around nine o'clock. And then well, the, it, it's basically kind of like a church service. We ha- there's some announcements and then there's a special and then there's a preacher. He'll get up and preach for 30 minutes. We say 30 minutes. Say they'll go 45, 50 minutes. So it throws the schedule completely all off, and so we're just kind of just winging it from that point. And then they'll have somebody else come and do a special, and then somebody else will preach, and then somebody else do a special, and then somebody else will preach. And then there's 15-minute breaks between each preacher, and so, and so there's time for fellowship. But then after the last uh, message and after the invitation, all that entire morning as there's a meeting going on in here, next door, there's our ladies. Thank you, ladies. Praise God for the ladies of Calvary Baptist Church. Because next door, there are ladies, and they are preparing a, a Thanksgiving course meal. And I'm talking turkeys. I'm talking stuffing. I'm talking mashed potatoes and gravy. And I, I, I'm talking the works here. And I'm talking they're also making pies. Praise the Lord, you can't have Thanksgiving without pie. So the, and and they're, they're laboring all morning long. They're getting everything ready. I, and I'm, they're, they're getting up earlier that morning, about two, three in the morning, get, getting the turkeys ready, carving the turkeys, all of that work. All of that is taking place. And the meeting will end around, well, this part of the meeting will end around maybe 1230, close to one. And so the, the, everybody that's in here will make their way next door. And they're having a big Thanksgiving meal there. I'm thinking maybe 60, maybe 70 people are having a big Thanksgiving meal. And then, of course, there's people who fellowship, and they'll stick around till probably around, oh, maybe 3 o'clock so, and then the people are just fellowshipping. And then the last person may be leaving around 3.30. And as the last person is leaving around 3.30, this is what our ladies are doing, even some of our men. They're wiping down tables. They're wiping down tables. They're cleaning up. They're throwing away trash. And then when 4 o'clock runs around, everybody, they grab a chair, they sit down, you know what I'm talking about? Especially you ladies who were a part of it. <sighs> you know what that's called? It's called ministry. So that's what it's called. That, that's ministry. Ministry can be exhausting. Ministry is exhausting. Preparing full course meals is exhausting. Wiping down tables is exhausting. Breaking down tables is exhausting. Uh, I, and fellowshipping, hey, that's a good thing, but it can be exhausting. Preaching can be exhausting. It certainly can. But, that, but what it transpired is what we call ministry. Hey, Jesus with his disciples, they're tired. They, they've ministered. Hey, a lot has transpired. We, last week we finished up uh, John chapter 5. And, and let me just say, a lot of events transpired between John chapter 5 and John chapter 6. Some of the events that transpired will be are recorded in Luke chapter 6 through 9. So, so many things that Jesus did. He, he did perform some miracles there. And then in Matthew chapter 5 and through 7, and we have the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus performed, uh, preached the Sermon on the Mount in, uh, between John chapter 5 and chapter 6. And he had also given parables regarding the kingdom in Luke chapter, or Matthew chapter 13. So a lot happens between John 5 and John 6. Is everybody with me on that? So no doubt they are ministering, no doubt they are tired, and no doubt they are exhausted. And we read in our passage that Jesus came in, in verse number 3 with his disciples that they might sit for a while. Sit. Hey, listen, Jesus just doesn't sit just for the sake of sitting. Sitting, I don't know if that's a word, sitting. But they, 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 he, can I say this? Jesus wasn't lazy. He wasn't lazy. He was a man. He was tired. The disciples, no doubt, tired. Traveling, ministering, working, exhausted, no doubt. And as they were traveling and as they were tired, we notice that a multitude gathers to Jesus near the Sea of Galilee. Look at verse 2, it says, And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. You know, according to Mark's gospel, speaking of the same account here, in Mark chapter 9, verses 34 through 35, the Bible says that Jesus had compassion on them. 
Okay, now, now, for those of you who, are, who have served next door with preparing the Thanksgiving meal and knock down tables and things of that sort, can you imagine you served, you're tired, you're exhausted, and then all of a sudden a multitude of people came. And then all of a sudden, the pastor at that time, because the pastor now would never do such a thing, but the pastor at that time would say, we're going to serve them. I'm pretty sure each and every one of us would say, oh boy. Right? I'm pretty sure each and every one of us would say, oh, I can't wait to start serving them. I can't wait to continue ministering unto them. But the Bible says that Jesus had compassion on them according to Mark. Hey, you know what that means? The ministry keeps moving forward. The ministry will keep moving forward. Ministry is exhausting. Ministry is tiring. Ministry can make you even sometimes want to pull your hair out, especially if you work in junior church. Hey, but here's the thing. Ministry needs to keep going. It needs to keep going forward. And Jesus had compassion on these people. And Mark's account tells us that the day was far spent and the disciples, they were ready to send the multitudes away. In Mark 6, verse 36, this is what the disciples said. They say, send them away that they may go into the country round about and into villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. So in the disciples' mind, Jesus ministered unto them no doubt they probably helped minister with Jesus. And so now the day's winding down, and now they're saying this, Lord, send them home. Lord, we're tired. Send them home. I mean, the, the day is far spent. Send them home because it's about to get dark soon. Send them home so that they can get some rest. Send them home so that they can get a bite to eat. You hear others just saying, send them home so that they can get a bite to eat? No doubt they were probably thinking about themselves. No doubt they were probably thinking, we're far spent as well. But this is what Jesus says. Jesus, he leads the disciples to consider the task of feeding the multitude. Feeding the multitude. Look at verse 5. It says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now we know that this multitude, hey, this just wasn't a couple hundred people. Even though that's a significant number as well. But we know that this is the multitude of 5,000 men. Not including women, not including children, but 5,000 men. So if there, was every, if, there was every, if there was one woman per man, that's just doubled. 10,000 people. And let's just say if there was one couple, and if one couple had at least one child, I mean 15,000 people. And if, if they had more than one kid, we're looking upwards to 15 to 20,000 people. That's a significant number, folks. I, I mean, hey, we're talking about crowds that would fill the ball arena, okay? And if you don't know what the ball arena is, that's where the, the Denver Nuggets play basketball. That's where the Colorado Avalanche, they play their hockey games. And can you imagine if, if I just said, hey, men, I need 12 volunteers because after the Denver Nuggets get done playing their game, we're going to feed everybody in that audience. Any volunteers? Yeah, that's kind of what I gathered. 15 to 20,000 people, significant number there. And then Jesus, he, he asked Philip this question. Here, let me reread it for you. It, it, it says, uh, uh, oh, where did it go? Verse number five. Jesus lifted up his eyes, had, he, his eyes and saw a great company come unto him. He saith unto Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Hey, Philip, where do you think we can buy some bread to feed these people? Um, beg your pardon? <laughs> where, where, where do you think we can buy bread? Now, of course, Jesus isn't asking because Jesus doesn't know. Because as, as you read in verse 6, the Bible says that Jesus was proving Philip. That means he was testing him. He wanted to see, hey, Philip, what do you think? What's your answer going to be? And then in verse number 7, Philip gives an answer. and says, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them. That every one of them may take a little. Hey, hey listen, church. A working man was content with a penny a day as fair wages. And, and so... Philip estimated that it would take the best part of two-thirds of a laborer's annual income to buy the bare minimum for everybody to partake of some bread. And even then, it would not be satisfying. Even then, they would just have just a little bit of bread. It would be more of an appetizer more than anything, not even a full meal. And then the disciple Andrew speaks up in verse 9. Look there. It says, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Here's Andrew. Andrew speaks up and says, well, 
Here's a boy. Here's a lad. And he has five barley loaves and two small fishes. Hey, listen, th- this bread that this boy had, he didn't have like big loaves of bread here. I mean, they, they would have been more so like wafers. They've been, been more so just something so minuscule. Five of these and two small fishes, probably the size of sardines. You know, you know really nothing a whole lot. And so here they are. And basically, by the sound of the reading of it, it kind of like says that the disciples are like, Lord, we did the math, and there ain't no way we can feed all these people. We don't have the resources to feed all these people. We, the, the situation is completely impossible to feed all these people. And usually when the situation is completely impossible and the resources aren't there, that just kind of makes for a good equation for a miracle to take place. Because what do they have? Five loaves of barley, two small fishes, an impossible situation, 15, 20,000 people upwards. They had all that, but one ingredient, the Son of God, is who they had. And what Jesus is going to do is he's about to reveal what can happen when anyone is surrendered to God. Look at verse 10, says, And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down and numbered them about 5,000. Now look at verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks. Now let's stop right there. Going back to the Gospel of Mark's account, the Bible says that when Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks, this is what the Bible says that he did, he looked up. When he gave thanks, he looked up. Hey, do you remember what he asked Philip? Where do you think we can buy bread? He's proving Philip, remember? He was testing Philip. He wanted to hear Philip's answer. And now it's like he's giving, now it's like Jesus is giving the answer here. And it's like Philip and the other disciples, they're looking at the impossible situation and they're looking for an earthly solution. You hear what I'm saying? They look at the impossible situation. This is what we have. This is how many multitudes there are. There's no way that this can feed this. It's impossible. But Jesus is trying to get them to understand. No, no, no. Don't look for earthly solutions. Let me show you where to look. Let me help you where to look. Look upwards. And he gave, and he gave thanks. And then the Bible says that he... In verse 11, he says, He distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Verse 12 tells us, it says, When they were filled. Hey, hey, listen, Jesus, he told them to, Boy, can you imagine that? Can you imagine organizing a seating chart for 20,000 people? 20,000 people. Hey, you sit here, you sit here, you sit here, you sit here. That's going to take a while in and of itself. And then not only that, but the Bible says that that Jesus distributed to the disciples and the disciples distributed to upwards of 20,000 people. That's going to take a long time. But the Bible also tells us that they were filled. So it just wasn't here. Here, here's one entree. And don't ask for seconds because we're not sure if we're going to have enough. That wasn't the case. No, this was all you can eat. I thought I'd get some amens with all you can eat, but I guess not. This was all you can eat. They were filled, the Bible says. And then we know the account, we know the story, even if you come to church for any lengthy period of time, I'm sure, that there was 12 baskets left over. Where did the 12 baskets go? We don't know. We don't know. We'll probably find out when we get to heaven, but it's not recorded for us as to where the 12 baskets went. Now, people have their theories and people have their ideas. Some, Some people might speculate, they think that one basket went to each disciple. As a reminder to them, hey, when you're looking at an impossible situations, don't look for earthly solutions. Continue to look up. Could be a reminder for them. Hey, remember? Remember the baskets? Remember the fish? Look up. Could be, some say it went to the little boy. (laughs) It was his lunch to begin with. And there is a law known as reaping and sowing. And sowing and reaping. There is that law. Hey, let me just say, when you give what little you have to the Lord Jesus Christ, he has a way of giving a lot more in return. He certainly, certainly does. But the fact of the matter is, we don't know where the 12 baskets went. All that we know is that Jesus took what what little they had, he gave thanks, looked for the one who really gives the supply, and there were 
filled the multitudes of people. And it was at that moment where the multitudes of people, this is, the, this is what began to happen. Look at verse number 14. It says, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. What's verse 14 referencing? Well, what it's referencing is that when the multitudes of people were filled, when the Lord satisfied their bellies, they started remembering what Moses had written in Deuteronomy chapter number 18. Because in Deuteronomy 18, the Bible says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, and thy brethren like unto me. Unto him shall ye hearken. And so what was transpiring in the minds of the multitudes is they're saying this, this is the prophet that Moses was talking about. This is the one that Moses wrote about in Deuteronomy chapter number 18. And so no doubt that they were excited about that. And at that moment, this is what they wanted to do. They wanted to make Jesus their king. 15 to 20,000 people. That's an army. To making Jesus their king, that's what they wanted to do right then and there. Hey, let me just say, if they got behind Jesus and made Jesus their king, then that would have stirred up a lot of hostility. That would have certainly would have upset the fruit basket under the Roman Empire for sure. Because it was the Roman Empire that ruled over Jerusalem, that ruled over Israel. But if the Israelites said, you know what, this is our king, Caesar's not our king anymore, then no doubt then there would have been a lot of hostility and that would, that would have ruffled up a lot of feathers for sure. But this is what Jesus did. Look at verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. What? Lord feeds them. Performs a miracle. Teaches the disciples where to look. Dishes out bread and fish an abundance of it so everybody's full, everybody's satisfied. And then when they're, when they're there and they're getting ready to make him their king, Jesus leaves. He departs. He sees what's in their hearts and he just goes away into a mountain by himself, not even taking his disciples with him. And it would really, it would really make us wonder and say, why would Jesus do that? Why would he leave? I, I, I mean... These are people, they understand that this is the one who Moses prophesied about. He's just not some up-and-coming new prophet. No, no, no. This was prophesied, and they know that Moses prophesied him. They understood him to be the Messiah, and yet, the, but for whatever reason, they wanted to make him king, but then Jesus leaves. Now, why would Jesus leave? Listen, look at verse 25 and 26. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi... When camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat the loaves and were filled. Hey, listen. Jesus didn't allow them to make him their king because their motive was this. Jesus can satisfy our bellies. Their, their, their motive it was... Their motive was that Jesus could satisfy their physical need, but not their greatest need, which was a spiritual need. Hey, listen, they knew Jesus was the Messiah. They knew that he was the one that Moses prophesied about. But they were wanting to, to follow him, not because he's the Messiah that can bring them uh, uh, the benefits of spiritual life, but they were more concerned about the physical life. And listen, Jesus didn't come to try to make people's lives easy Jesus came to provide everlasting life for sinners. But they saw the Messiah as this. Hey, you know what? He can provide for us. He's, given, he's filled our bellies. And since he's filled our bellies, then he can provide for us in every course of life. So let's make him king, not so that he can bring us everlasting life, but for this, for, for this reason, he makes our life easier. Did you hear that? He makes our lives easier. Hey, listen, their motive for making, them king, for making him king was a selfish motive. It was a selfish motive to make Jesus king. But here's the thing. Jesus looks inside the heart and he knew, he knew what their motive was. Jesus didn't come to make life easy. 
Jesus came to bring everlasting spiritual life. That's what he came for. They had a corrupt motive. They had a selfish motive. And sadly today, hey, there are even people today that still do that. There are people today who still desire to make Jesus king, but for selfish reasons. Hey, listen, 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 listen. Jesus is king regardless. Jesus is king (laughs) regardless of what we say or regardless of what we do. But here's, Jesus wants to be your king. Jesus wants to be their king. Jesus wants to be my king. He certainly does. But, but listen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, if, we, if our desire of making Jesus king is so that he can make our lives easier, then we're going to be greatly disappointed. Because listen, there are people today who, who, who go out into the world and they get beat up by the world. I, I mean, the world takes them to places where they never even thought that they would be. Hey, listen, church, when you live according to the world, you're going to pay the world's price. That, that is going to happen. You live like the world, you talk like the world, you act like the world, you go party like the world, you do that the world does. That does come at a price. You just can't just say, like, all will be well. No, that will come at a price. But when people go and they venture out and they live into the world and the world beats them up and they're starting to reap the consequences of their choices, here's the thing. They always know where to go back to. They always know. They always know to go back to church. They always know to go back to Jesus. They always know to go back to God. But here's the thing. Yes, is Jesus the answer? Absolutely. Is God the answer? Absolutely. But listen, don't make Jesus your king just so that he can make your life easier. So many times people there just say, well, you know what? If I just go back and start serving Jesus, then all my problems are going to go away. All my issues are going to go away. All my old temptations are going to go away. If I just go back and start serving Jesus and going to church, then you know what? Then all of life's problems will just resolve. And poof, they're not even there anymore. You know what that is? You want to make him king, but not king of your heart, king of your belly. Make your life easier. Hey, listen, that's still a selfish motive. (laughs) That's still thinking of number one. That's still pride. If I make Jesus king, then all my issues are going to be resolved. Hey, listen. In all actuality, Jesus said the exact opposite. This is what Jesus said. You follow me, the world's going to hate you. Isn't that what he said? He said, if the world's going to hate me, then the world's going to hate you. That's what he said. So many times people say, well, I'm going to start going to church so I can make so-and-so happy. I'm going to start going to church so that I can make my husband happy. I'm going to start going to church so I can make my wife happy. I'm going to start going to church to make my kids happy. I'm going to start going to church so that this can happen. And so that my life can just get easier. Listen, the Lord doesn't want to be your king to make your life easier. Hey, you know, listen, church, if we are going to make the Lord our king, and we're going to live our lives according to his word, then listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. His word, is, <laughs> his word goes in one direction, and our culture and our society tends to go in the opposite direction. And if we're going to make him king, and if he's going to be lord of our lives, then listen, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to make a lot of people upset when we don't go with the flow. We're going to make a lot of people upset when we don't go with the way that the the, the culture sways or the way that they say or the way that they think. No, 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 no. If he's going to be king of our lives and king of our hearts, then we must stay true to the book. We must. Hey, listen, church. Like I said, Jesus didn't come to make your life easier. Talk about discouraging. (laughs) Jesus didn't come to make your life easier. Hey, don't get me wrong. When you make Jesus the king of your life, there are blessings. There are an overabundance of blessings. I mean, just the other day, uh, the kids were outside playing in the snow. My wife and I, being the smart ones, we were inside. And we're sitting on the couch, and we're just talking about the, oh my, so I don't, I don't even know how it came up, but we're just talking about, and we're just looking, and we're just thinking, look what God did for us. Look what God did. 
hey, there's, there are some physical blessings that come with serving God. There are some physical blessings when you decide to make the Lord Jesus Christ king of your life. And not king of your bellies, but king of your hearts. There are some blessings. We serve a father who takes care of his children. And I'm a child of God, and I can testify to that. He takes good care of me. He certainly does. And there's my wife and I. We're talking, and we're looking. We're just looking around our houses. Look what God did. God gave us this. God gave us this. God gave us this. God gave us that that's parked outside. God gave us that that's parked outside. God gave us all these blessings. God gave us a good church family. God gave us resources to be successful in the ministry. God has given us family members. God has given us all these things to be a blessing unto us. We serve a really good God. We certainly do. But listen, listen, listen. Just because there's blessings doesn't mean there's an absence of trials. Did you hear that? Just because God's blessed you greatly doesn't mean that there's not going to be any trials. Because here's the thing, God's people still undergo trials. God's people still have cancer. God's people still go through financial struggles. God's people still go through health struggles. God's people still have uh, marital problems. God's people still have uh, 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 problems with, at work. God's people have, have struggles just like every other person has struggles. God's people have struggles. But here's the thing. What's our motive for following him? Is our motive for following him so that he can just get rid of the struggles? Can I just say that's a shallow motive? The shallow motive. And if that's the motive for serving Jesus, if that's the motive for going to church, if that's the motive for trying to please people, if that's the motive to make your life easier, then here's the thing, you're going to burn out. You're going to burn out because your motive for following Jesus is all done in the flesh. And you can only do it for so long before you burn out. Hey, our motive for following him, our motive for making him king of our life shouldn't be for what he provides for us physically. Our motive for making him king of our lives is what he provides for us spiritually, and that's everlasting life. That should be the motive as to why we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Our motive for following Jesus Christ here at Calvary Baptist Church shouldn't be so that he can bless us with the latest and greatest of technologies and we can do all these cool, cool things with the building. No, 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 that shouldn't be the motive there. Because that's a selfish motive. The motive shouldn't be so, hey, maybe I'll start giving them a tithes and my offerings and then, I can, and then I can get a raise. No, that shouldn't be the motive. The motive should be, well, first of all, should be because we love him. <laughs> and we love him because he first loved us. And the, and the way that he first loved us is that he made it possible so that you, a sinner who doesn't deserve the love of God, and me, a sinner who doesn't deserve the love of God, that we might experience his love and that through faith in Jesus and Jesus alone can acquire everlasting life. Yeah. Jesus doesn't want to be king of your belly. Jesus, oh, okay. I might lose you here. I hope not. Jesus is less concerned for your physical well-being than he is your spiritual well-being. He's more concerned for your spiritual well-being than your physical well-being. Well, why do you say that? Well, this is a true statement. You'll be dead a whole lot longer than you'll be alive. You'll be dead a whole lot longer. I'm reminded of, remember, remember the, the man who was paralyzed and he was, and, and they, they, poor Peter, they destroyed his roof. Remember that? They destroyed his roof and they, they lowered him before, before Jesus. They're on, this, they're on the bed there and, and, and as he's on the bed there, what did Jesus say? The first thing that Jesus said was this, thy sins be forgiven thee. Hey, Jesus, what, Jesus knew the problem. He knew he was paralyzed. He knew he couldn't walk. But Jesus was more concerned about the spiritual than the physical. And he said, thy sins be forgiven thee. Thy faith had made thee whole. And then, and then, he took care of the physical. Hey, listen, church family. We at Calvary Baptist Church, Jesus needs to be king of our lives. He needs to be king of your life. He certainly does. But what's your motive for making him king? Is your motive so that life gets easier? Is your motive so that the problems will go away? 
Is your motive so that he can fix the marriage issue? Is your motive so he can fix the financial issue? Is the, marriage, is the motive so he can fix the health issue, thinking that you're going to get on God's good side and then he'll take away all these problems? It's a selfish motive. That's a motive thinking about the belly, yourself. Don't follow him for what he can provide for you physically. Follow him for what he provides for you spiritually. And that's everlasting life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you, dear God, for this morning that you've given us. And Lord, I, I ask you, Lord, that you would help each and every one of us, Lord, to have.